Hey, um, welcome everybody. I hope you're out there. Uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about turkey vultures, California conors, and migration, just like it says on the screen. I want to thank all the people who contributed photos for this presentation. Thank you so much. And I want to thank you for attending. And after the talk, if you're not a member of ABNA already, you might consider joining this great group of people that I've been involved with for it seems like decades now. And then you'll be invited to more talks like this and other events, and um, including uh, next week's talk, which will be on Swainson's Hawks by Hal Cohen. So you don't wanna miss that one. But let's get to the program because we got a lot to cover and there's gonna be a tough test at the end. So you wanna be sure to take notes. Just kidding. Anyway, um, we're going to start off uh, with a little bit about migration, just to remind you what that's all about. And here are some key terms. So, of course, to migrate means to go to one place and then to actually return. So it kind of implies a round trip, whereas emigrate is more of a one way trip. So some species do one or the other. Um, and then there's dispersals, which is a little more random and irregular in its fashion. And it's more of a spreading. It's not a, a direct trip somewhere necessarily. For example, the zone-tailed hawks uh, seem to be increasing their range and it's somewhat of a dispersal. Over the years, we've seen other species like great-tailed grackles and Eurasian collar doves spread all over the country and disperse. So that's another term that that we might use tonight, you might hear. Mostly we're gonna talk about migration tonight though, real migration. And turkey vultures will be one of our main subjects and they definitely uh, migrate. They go somewhere and they come back, at least most of them do. And some are gonna come as far from South America all the way up to Canada. So there's four major North American flyways that you can see here. Of course, the birds don't know this. They just are born with the ability to find their way where they need to go using forces that we haven't even learned about, but they use magnetic fields. They use uh, an internal compass. They use the stars if they're migrating at night to navigate. They use their own knowledge from previous trips and landmarks that they've learned. Um, so there's various tools that birds use to find their way to where they're going. But of course, we live along what's called the Pacific Flyway, as you can see here, this yellow zone. And that's what we'll be talking about tonight, mostly, Pacific Flyway. And we're very fortunate to live right smack in the middle of this flyway. So this time of year, we get to see all these birds passing through, including turkey vultures and others. And for some species, turkey vultures, the migration begins. Move here. A group of vultures sometimes is called a doom or a wake. Uh, and then other species, and the willow flycatcher as an example, won't start migrating until late June. So by the time they're heading north, uh, the first migrants are already heading south and they kind of cross paths. Um, so spring migration is spread out, but the bulk of the species are going to be migrating from about now through first week of May. So it, we're really getting into prime time for migration, the month of April in particular and early May. Some different types of migration. If all members of a species migrate, we call that a complete migration. If some of the species or some of the members of the species migrate, but others don't, then that's called a partial migrant or a partial migration. And most birds fall into this category, including uh, turkey vultures, by the way. And then some species migrate up and down the slopes, and so you might characterize them as an altitudinal migrant. And that depends on food and the weather. And still others are more irregular in their movements, 
it's kind of hard to predict when they're going to show up. They may show up once every 10 years or not at all. Uh, and we call this eruptive. And it usually depends on food. Food is usually the driving factor there or some severe weather event. Now, most species actually migrate at night. Sometimes we forget this, but a lot of our our um, favorite migrants, uh, orioles and warblers and sparrows and tanagers, they're all flying throughout the night. They're night migrants. Um, daytime migrants, of course, fly throughout the day and, and the subjects of tonight's talk, the vultures are members of this group, they're daytime migrants. And then um, those that kind of migrate in between, uh, we might call crepuscular migrants. They like to fly at dusk or in the early morning, but not strictly through the night and not through the middle of the day either. So we call these crepuscular. Uh, Vox's swifts come to mind, uh, which are migrating through at this moment. They're crepuscular migrants. So vultures would be in that daytime migrant category. Couple more migration types, soaring migrants. Uh, these are daytime migrants that use rising thermals, updrafts to help carry them along. Vultures, of course, are in this group. And then birds that actually have to flap their wings to move are called powered migrants. So a lot of our, our migrants fall into this category. And all the ones that fly at night are powered migrants, relying on their own power to move them along. As you'll see later, and you probably already know, vultures uh, cheat and use currents to move them. Now, next week's um, topic actually is Swainson's hawks, so you don't want to miss that one. It's next Friday night by Hal Cohen, and Hal just told me recently that in 2003, he was actually watching migrating turkey vultures when he noticed a whole bunch of Swainson's hawks uh, mixed in with them, and that's what started the Swainson's hawk watch that a lot of you are familiar with that's going on right now. In fact, a lot of those hawk watchers are probably missing this talk because they're out there counting Swainson's hawks that are coming in as we speak uh, for the night in Borrego Springs. We've also been seeing a number of Swainson's hawks where I live here in the Palm Desert area too, which is kind of neat. Anyway, these Swainson's hawks, you'll, you'll hear all about them next week, but some of them are traveling as far as 7,000 miles from Argentina to Canada. And in fact, if they go to Alaska, it's even more than 7,000 miles but on average it might be 5,000 miles and that's plenty. How high do migrants fly, do you ask? Well, it varies tremendously depending on the species. Um, the world record might be 37,000 feet, but that's, that was an oddity, uh, but a vulture was uh, seen at that height. Uh, hawks certainly are capable of flying very high and sometimes they have to fly um, over 10,000 feet to get over mountain ranges, but they prefer to stay below 5,000 feet if possible. So generally speaking, raptors and, and other birds as well tend to fly lower than you might think or low, as low as they can get away with, you might say. So here are some of these uh, daytime soaring type migrants. Uh, including the turkey vulture, which I'm going to talk about, and the osprey, and the red-tailed hawk. Um, they tend to fly below four to 5,000 feet. Some other daytime migrants that you could be seeing even today uh, include uh, white pelicans, which are soaring migrants. They'll use those rising updrafts and ride the thermals without flapping their wings. And sometimes they will flap their wings, so they kind of do both uh, powered migration and soaring migration, whereas barn swallows are mostly a powered migrant relying on their, their wings to move them along. So swallows are passing through during the day right now. Why are these birds risking their lives and migrating in the first place? There's a lot of reasons. Uh, the days, as you've noticed, are getting longer, and birds know that too, and longer days means more opportunity to feed in the northern hemisphere, so that's one reason. They also are sometimes trying to get away from a harsh climate and go to somewhere where the climate is more conducive to nesting and feeding. But 
when you boil it all down, it's always all about the food. They go to wherever the food is. There's different ways to study uh, migration. These are some of the ways here. I'm gonna focus on the bottom two tonight, but um, sometimes they use radar, just like the weather forecasters, when, and that can detect mass movements of birds on the screen. Um, bird banding and mist nets are used. That's something I've done a lot of in the past to put uh, bands on these birds and then hope that somebody might catch them at some other time and you can tell where they're moving. Sometimes you can do special marking of individual birds so you can recognize them as individuals and do population studies. Sometimes you can count birds flying across the moon on a full moon night or shine a bright light, a celometer into the sky and count the birds that cross the beam and use uh, biostatistics to figure out how many birds are migrating. Um, but again, the bottom two here are the ones I wanna focus on tonight. Um, radio telemetry, as you'll see in a moment, it was where you have an antenna attached to a bird, usually one of the larger birds like a vulture. Um, oh, and uh, you track them with a, um, a device that will allow you to see where they are. The, the problem with that is you have to be pretty close to the bird in order to be able to track it. Um, these days, um, satellite tags are becoming more popular and geolocators are also used. And these use satellites uh, and signals that are transmitted to the satellites and back to your laptop to help track these birds. So let's have a look at some of these. So on the lower right here, you can see, uh, uh, here's a whip antenna on a larger bird, a duck. And um, here's somebody tracking a, a larger bird um, using radio telemetry. But again, you have to be fairly close to the bird in order to get a signal. If you can attach a device to a large bird like a vulture, like one of these um, satellite tags or geolocators, which are similar to this, um, you can then use your laptop and use the signals that bounce off the satellites to figure out where those birds are at any moment in time. So we're seeing more and more of this. And of course, the, the devices are getting smaller and smaller every year and less obtrusive to the birds. And sometimes they've even surgically implanted these like they did with the bar-tailed godwit to figure out that it flies from Alaska to New Zealand nonstop. So I know this isn't a vulture or a condor, but I've got to mention it because it's, it's uh, an amazing migration story. And last year in 2020, um, the bar-tailed godwit set a new record of uh, flying 7,581 miles nonstop. That's nonstop in 11 days of flying from Alaska to New Zealand. And because they have a little um, satellite tag attached to them, um, they can track them every step of the way, which is pretty neat. So we're gonna see more and more of this kind of thing. And, and, and we're gonna try to put some of these things on Swainson's hawks and, and turkey vultures. And, and really figure out where these birds are coming from and where they're going. There've been a number of laws passed over the years to help migrating birds. Um, call your attention to the one in 1918 in particular, a little over hundred years ago. It's still our, probably our most important law to help protect um, migratory birds. It's called the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. The duck stamp was created in 1934. And if you buy a duck stamp, you can help support our National Wildlife Refuges, and that's a good thing to do. And other laws like the Neotropical Migratory Bird Conservation Act were passed in the year 2000. And there's plenty of books out there if you wanna read up on migration and become an expert. So let's get on with the show. The next uh, main topic is turkey vultures. We'll start with turkey vultures, then we'll move on to condors, California condors. Anyway, both birds are in the same family, Cathartidae. Um, and here you can see a turkey vulture on the left and a California condor on the right. And all members of this family have certain characteristics. The unfeathered heads, because of the fact that they've got to stick these heads into foul carcasses, and it's a pretty messy life they lead. So it helps them clean up better to have no feathers on the heads. They've got hooked bills, good for tearing. They consume dead stuff or carrion. And um, 
our vultures do not make any noises. At least they don't sing, as you'll see, but they can make some hissing and grunting sounds. So the turkey vulture is closely related to the condor. They're in the same family. And even back in 1844, um, Audubon was calling it the California turkey vulture. This is a California condor, originally called the California turkey vulture for a while. Why is it called the turkey vulture? Well, you can probably see there's a resemblance to the wild turkey. So there are seven new world vultures in the world here in the Americas. And three of those are, are right here in North America. And uh, my wife wanted you to know that Africa, Africa has 11 species. Um, and those would be old world vultures in a totally different family. And none of those African vultures can smell, by the way. Our new world vultures have a good sense of smell, except for that one on the right there, the black vulture. We'll get back to him in a minute. And now you're probably wondering, well, what are the other four New World vultures? Uh, we know about the turkey vulture and the California condor and the black vulture I just showed you that are here in North America. But uh, to the south of us in Central and South America, you've also got uh, two species of yellow-headed vultures and the beautiful king vulture and the Andean condor. And I've had the privilege to see all of these uh, down in Central and South America over the years. So seven vultures in the new world and three of them in our neighborhood. Now our new world vultures, as I mentioned before, can't sing because they lack the song structure, which is called a syrinx, the voice box, um, the ability to give bird, or the, the structure that gives birds the ability to sing. And so you can see it on the right here. So vultures lack a syrinx. Um, and the raven does have a syrinx, and it's also considered to be the largest songbird. A little trivia for you. Here's how a turkey vulture is categorized from kingdom on down to species, in case you're wondering. Uh, the, the scientific name, Cathartes aura, refers to being a cleanser or a purifier, and aura comes from a Native American or Mexican name. That's your turkey vulture. So you're familiar with turkey vultures. They do migrate through our desert. Some stay all year. Uh, we're seeing this happen more and more. I think in Borrego Springs, they've noticed more turkey vultures staying all year recently. I think the same thing might be happening in the Coachella Valley region. So that means we'd characterize turkey vultures as a partial migrant. So some members or probably most turkey vultures um, migrate every year, whereas some to stay in the same place. And vultures are, are long lived birds living up to 60 years. Generally speaking, the larger the bird, the longer it lives or can live. Their wingspan is about six feet. So they're big birds. They hold their wings in kind of a V shape. It's called a dihedral. That helps identify them at a, at a distance compared to say eagles or even condors, which hold their wings more flat. And as I mentioned already, they're partial migrants. And on a good day, um, they, could, they could travel as much as 300 miles. So it kind of depends on the weather, of course, and how early or late a start they get and where they want to stop over. So these soaring birds like turkey vultures have what we call a low aspect ratio. This is where you take the length of the wing and divide it by the width. And um, low aspect ratio creates a lot of drag, which means turkey vultures aren't the fastest birds around, but it, it's also going to help them get the lift that they need. Now, the albatross, on the other hand, has a high aspect ratio. You can see the wings are really long, but really thin. And so when you divide one into the other, you get a very, very fast bird that can just cut right through the air like butter. But of course, they're not going to get the tremendous lift uh, that a turkey vulture might get. So there's trade-offs always with wing shapes. There's also something called wing loading. And this is where you take the weight of the bird and divide it by the area of the wing. 
And in the turkey vultures case, they've got a low wing loading, which again, gives them a nice ability to, to catch an updraft and be carried on the wind. So that's what you want if you're a turkey vulture, low wing loading. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, an ostrich with its teeny little useless wings and heavy bodies, 320 pounds. There's no way this bird's ever gonna get off the ground. Its wing loading is way too high. So turkey vultures uh, usually nest on cliffs and uh, normally lay two eggs. And if the eggs are lost, they don't lay them again, but apparently black vultures and condors will lay a second clutch if the first clutch is destroyed or ruined. Young turkey vultures have grayish heads, so they don't get the red head right away. And it takes them about five years to reach sexual maturity. Now here's a fun fact. And uh, for those of you residents um, or snowbirds, I should say, um, who got stuck here in the desert this past summer because you couldn't leave, um, this is a good uh, tip, survival tip to keep you cool in the hot summer. I can hear you laughing out there. And here's another fun fact um, that Hal reminded me of the other day. Vultures can vomit up to 10 feet. So watch out, don't get too close. Now, when you're watching turkey vultures, you wanna keep an eye out for imposters. So look at the bird on the right. It actually mimics the turkey vulture in many ways. It's about the same size, a little smaller, but it's still a large hawk and has the same general outline as a turkey vulture. But there's a couple little differences that are hard to see at a distance, but up close you might notice them. You can see the yellow sear on the bill, whereas a turkey vulture does have a yellow tip of the bill, but you see this red head and face here that you wouldn't see on the zone-tailed hawk. And then you wanna look at the underside of the tail and look for some white banding, which you won't see in the turkey vulture. You'll see some paleness to the tail here, but it's not a white banding. Again, it's hard to see this at a distance, so sometimes the bird has to come close, but if you see a strange turkey vulture in the kettle, keep an eye on it. It could be a zone-tailed hawk, and as I mentioned before, zone-tailed hawks are being seen more and more in Southern California. So it's just a matter of time before we find one uh, in Borrego Springs mixing in with the turkey vultures. I was there yesterday morning to see a couple hundred uh, Swainson's hawks and turkey vultures. It was a really good day. And uh, Hal told me if I could find a broadwing hawk, he would buy me dinner. So I, I put that broadwing hawk here to remind me and you to keep watching for a broadwing hawk, which would be a rare bird, but it's something that does occur every now and then mixed in with these other hawks. So I have a new goal to find a broad-winged hawk. Turkey vultures, as you probably know, are scavengers and they eat carrion. Um, you can debate this if you want, but technically speaking, they're not raptors because they deal in already dead food. They don't have to grab or seize their prey in order to, to kill it. Um, so they're technically not raptors, but most people kind of lump them in that group with hawks and eagles and things. And here are some of the other things that they like to eat. They love snakes, but they'll even eat things as small as tadpoles or rotting vegetables and other things too. So to, to really be a raptor, um, which in Latin means to seize or plunder, you've got to be doing this kind of thing like this hawk is doing where you're actually seizing a rabbit and taking it away instead of just finding something already dead like vultures do, carrion. So vultures have special enzymes internally that 
enable them to eat foul food, rotting food uh, that could have harmful bacteria that might kill us if we tried to eat it, but their enzymes seem to deal with it well. And that's why they can live the lifestyle that they do. And it turns out that turkey vultures and condors have a good sense of smell, unlike those African old world vultures, which can't smell at all, except for the black vulture. For some reason, the black vulture does not have a good sense of smell. And so what it will do is it will follow the turkey vultures and um, look to where they're going and cheat. And this is another uh, species, by the way, that may mix in with turkey vultures. And there've been a couple records already in California. So again, it's just a matter of time before we see one of these black vultures uh, showing up at the hawk count in Borrego Springs. So maybe this would be worth a free dinner too, if I could find one of those. Now these, these black vultures are pretty easy to spot because they're smaller than turkey vultures. They've got a, a, quite a bit of white at the tips of their primary feathers that, that's very distinct and they flap a lot. Uh, because their wings aren't as long, they can't hold them steady as long as a turkey vulture can, and they have to flap in between to keep aloft. And so you'll notice a, a weird vulture in the midst of the cattle that keeps flapping and flapping and flapping when the other ones aren't, and that's going to be the black vulture. They're usually found in the southern states. You know, if you go to Florida or Louisiana, places like that, you can expect to see black vultures but there's actually a small population of them in Southern Arizona, not too far from us. So watch for them. On the genetic tree of birds, um, turkey or vultures and vultures in general are more closely related to storks than they are to hawks. Another reason not to call them raptors. Interesting fact. And some of these roosting spots are passed down from generation to generation. I'm sure um, even in Borrego Springs, there are, of course, roosting spots that the hawks and the vultures prefer to use. And they're going to pass that information down to their offspring as well. Famous vulture watching sites. We got to start with right here in Brago Springs. Um, I'm calling it Howell's Hill. I don't know what they what they call it, but there's two hills um, in Brago Springs. There's one on DiGiorgio Road and one on Brago Valley Road that a lot of you are familiar with, where the hawk watchers are in the morning and in the evening. Um, and that's what I'm calling Howell's Hill. I didn't have a picture of Howell's Hill, but I do have a picture of the sign I took yesterday. Um, and um, I promised my daughter I'd sneak her into the show. So I stuck this in here to represent her standing on Howell's Hill looking for Swainson's Hawks, even though this is actually in Tasmania. And that's a, an odd looking um, geological feature called the nut, the southern, or southern tip of Tasmania. She's actually looking for penguins, believe it or not. Um, some other famous uh, vulture watching sites include one of my favorites, a place called Hawk Mountain in Kempton, Pennsylvania. And it's been there for over 100 years. I mean, the mountain's been there for millions of years, but the, the hawk watchers have been doing this since the early days of the Audubon Society. Um, as you may remember, they used to shoot hawks for fun over a hundred years ago and the Audubon Society and, and the Hawk Mountain Sanctuary folks helped put an end to that and turn it into more of a hawk watching um, ordeal. And we call that the Christmas bird count too. So this is where the Christmas bird count originated as well. And um, here's uh, my other son, Luke, um, on Hawk Mountain. And so during hawk watching season, this is in Pennsylvania, um, these boulders here are just filled with people in binoculars, all scanning the ridges here for vultures and eagles and hawks and falcons, you name it, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of them passing by. So that's something you might want to do one day, visit Hawk Mountain during migration in the fall. 
But what I like to say uh, when it comes to vultures is, and, I, and I'm joking, but maybe there's some truth to it, but I like to say that our vultures are headed to Hinkley, Ohio, because they have this annual event every March um, called Buzzard Days, where they welcome the vultures. So just like they welcome the swallows returning to Capistrano in Ohio, they anxiously await the return of the vultures. And the first buzzard day was on March 17th, which was just two days ago, 1957. So I probably should have given this talk on Wednesday to celebrate buzzard day. Um, but every third, about third weekend in March or that whole week, really, they have uh, festivities revolving around vultures. And um, you may ask yourself, well, where is Hinkley, Ohio? Well, I'm glad you asked because there it is. So according to my calculations then, after the turkey vultures leave Borrego Springs and head north, when they hit Idaho, they take a hard right and that leads them directly to Hinkley, Ohio for the vulture festival. What do you think about that theory? Oops. And they've got this beautiful scoreboard there to help keep track of the vulture sightings and other raptors that they see as well. And I've been hoping for years that we could get a buzzard scoreboard or a Swainson's Hawk scoreboard like this in Borrego Springs. And um, I think that Abna is working on that as we speak. And I know just the place to put it. So if Hal or Betsy or Mike are listening, um, you know that little piece of property that Abna owns on the Christmas circle that you don't know what to do with? Wouldn't that be the perfect place for a big Swings and Socks scoreboard like this one to welcome everybody into town and let them know what the score is? Just a suggestion. And also a reminder to all of you to report your bird sightings, all bird sightings to ebird.org so we can have Christmas bird counts every day. Okay, well that was um, vultures, turkey vultures. And now we're gonna kind of move into um, the relative of the vulture, the condor. We talk about California condors. We do have some condors very close to Borrego Springs, just south of the border. So one of these days um, we're gonna see a condor mix in with the Swainson's hawks and the turkey vultures. And if, if a broad winged hawk is worth a free dinner, I don't know what a California condor sighting is gonna be worth. But let's talk about these condors. And uh, here's the breakdown of the condor from kingdom down to species. Again, the same family as the turkey vulture and the black vulture. Uh, there used to be two condors, now there's just one. So this is the only surviving member of this genus. And it refers to the naked head that is a characteristic of the vulture family. How heavy are these birds? Um, 29 pounds. That's pretty heavy for a bird. Of course, an ostrich can be over 300 pounds, but still for a, for a flying bird, that's heavy. And just like turkey vultures, they can live up to about 60 years. Um, 40 might be more typical. But, they, but if they don't get into trouble, and some of them do, um, they can have a nice long life. And here's um, Drake to show you how big the wingspan of a condor is, almost 10 feet, just amazing. So I got all three kids in the show, so everybody, nobody can complain about that. That was at the Phoenix Zoo, by the way. They've got a wonderful display about condors at the Phoenix Zoo. They can glide. Um, as fast as 75 miles an hour, depending on what kind of tailwind they have behind them. And they can fly high if they want to, up to 20,000 feet, but they prefer to fly low. So again, uh, they, they fly as low as they can get away with. In this case, they wanna be able to see and to smell um, their next meal. Their favorite food um, is probably dead deer but they, they're opportunistic and will eat anything that's dead. 
even small mammals. Uh, kind of like turkey vultures, uh, condors nest on high cliff ledges, very remote locations where predators hopefully can't get to them. And sometimes if there's no cliff ledges, they might nest in a giant sequoia like this one did. Their nest is not much of a nest. It's, it's what you might call a scrape. So it's just a very light depression in the ground that's barely adequate to hold the egg and keep it from rolling off the cliff. And sometimes uh, inexperienced parents do lose the eggs. They'll roll right off the cliff. They lay just one egg at a time and that's every other year. So they can't even manage one egg a year. So it's a very low, what we call biotic potential. And that's one of the reasons they're not able to reproduce quickly and need our help to get their numbers up. Just like the turkey vulture, the young condor has a dark head and it takes them five to seven years to reach maturity and get that bright reddish naked head. Now at the end of the Pleistocene epoch, uh, about 10,000 years ago, you can see where condors were ranging throughout the Pacific coast, not just California, and all the way down into Mexico, not too far into Mexico, but a little bit into Mexico and all the way up to the Pacific Northwest and even Canada. There was a, a population here in Florida, disjunct from the main population, and then this weird little population in New England. I don't know what's going on there. But of course, you're not going to see condors um, in the east anymore. And this range here has decreased tremendously, as you're going to see. So back, um, when you go back tens of thousands of years um, into that previous epoch, um, there was a second condor, which is now extinct. It was even larger than the California condor. And if you have a chance to visit the Page Museum at the La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles, I highly recommend it. And you can see some fantastic displays about these extinct condors and a huge collection of condor bones and skeletons. Uh, when Lewis and Clark moved through couple hundred years ago, they encountered condors in the Pacific Northwest. They were still up there in Washington and Oregon back then. But by 1930, they would be completely restricted to California and mostly Southern California. So it didn't take long for their range to shrink. And in 1904, just over a hundred years ago, um, Joseph Grinnell at UC Berkeley was already um, noticing um, the demise of the condor and uh, considered it to be a symbol of our lessening wilderness. And I already mentioned um, Audubon calling it the California turkey vulture there. So condors have been declining for decades, for century. And uh, we're gonna go through some of the things that have led to this decrease in their numbers. Um, of course, hunters would shoot them just for fun, uh, not for any particular reason, or maybe they thought they were bad. Um, egg collectors took a toll. A condor egg could go for $300 in the early 1900s. That's a lot of money back then. Egg collecting was a big deal. Um, accidental poisoning has been taking a toll for over 100 years. And by 1982, there were only 22 birds left in the wild. And it seemed like they were going to disappear completely. The Chumash Indians are the ones who live in the main range of the California condor. So they've always revered the condor and certainly didn't want to see it disappear. Um, Miners were using condor quills to carry gold dust in. They're so big 
and have a big hollow area that they could, it was a convenient way to carry gold dust back in the 1800s, early 1900s. Jane Goodall's demonstrating. DDT is a factor and was a factor. And it was used um, extensively in Condor country back in the 50s and 60s and um, has affected many birds, not just the condor, but many birds at the top of the food chain cannot reproduce and their eggshells can't uh, get to the right thickness because of the presence of DDT in the food chain. Luckily, DDT was banned in 1972, but there's still a lot of it out there that we continue to deal with. But it's definitely helped. Um, and since 1972, to a number of birds are on the road to recovery because of the removal of DDT. Now, power lines affect large birds like the condor because if they can touch two wires at one time, it, they become electrocuted. And they're big enough to do that. And so um, that's one of the, the big issues with condors is trying to keep them away from these high tension wires and power lines so they don't get electrocuted. Uh, wind turbines are another newer thing that has appeared in their hunting grounds, you might say, that um, can cause problems if they hit those turbines. So more and more, we're just throwing a lot of stuff up into the airspace, airspace obstructions that are taking a toll on birds of prey, including condors. So it's not just the power lines, but it's also now the cell phone towers and, and radio towers in certain places. Um, there's just a lot of junk in the airspace now that needs to be considered, you know, when we're trying to help the condor recover. And of course, habitat loss is always a huge problem and probably the number one issue for most species that are declining. They're just losing habitat. They're losing a place to live because you know, humans are moving in and changing the landscape to, to something that's not always favorable to wildlife. And this is happening more and more in condor country too. And probably the number one reason that condors uh, have declined in the past few decades has to do with lead poisoning and lead bullets. Um, we used to use lead for so many products. Fortunately, a lot of those products now are, diff are using different substances instead of lead, um, including bullets now here in California. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, if you look at the crop of a condor or a vulture, you're liable to find all kinds of stuff in there, including lead fragments, but other micro trash as well, which can uh, shorten their lifespan for sure, and sometimes cause their digestive tract to seize up. In 2008, our governor, the Terminator, um, signed in a law that banned lead ammunition in condor country. So that was a first initial step to try to get the lead out of California. Then to follow up on that in 2018, um, our governor, Jerry Brown, signed into law a ban on lead ammunition throughout the state of California through Proposition 63. So California, I think, is the first state to completely ban lead ammunition, use of it in the state. Uh, and the military is also switching to non-lead alternatives. So if California can do it and the military can find alternatives, I'm confident that other states can eventually do the same. But as you know, it's not always easy to change the way people do things. But for the benefit of condor and other wildlife, um, condors. I think it's worth it here. These are some of those laws. I mentioned a couple of them earlier, but these are laws that help protect condors, starting with the Lacey Act in 1900. And uh, don't want to forget the Endangered Species Act of 1973. So all of these acts um, are still in effect today, helping to protect condors and other species as well.
Now in the 70s and 80s, um, they had an event um, up in a place called Mount Pinus, which is north of LA where I kind of grew up. And it was called the Condor Watch and Tequila Bust. And um, I don't know if you can see this. I'm holding it up to the screen here, but this is my t-shirt from the Condor Watch and Tequila Bus 1980. So this little t-shirt I have, which doesn't fit me anymore, by the way, um, is 41 years old, but I still have it. And I remember my dad took me to the Condor Watch and Tequila Bust. And of course I was there to watch condors, not for tequila. Um, but that event definitely affected me in a couple of profound ways. One, I've been watching condors and other raptors um, ever since. Um, so it really had a, a good effect on me there. And number two, um, when I saw the negative effect that the tequila had on some of those condor watchers, I kind of vowed to become a teetotaler, which I've been. And if you, uh, some of you kids out there don't know what a teetotaler is, then you better look that one up. But it all started back there in the condor watch and tequila bust. And they used to have that every year on a certain weekend in the fall. And um, so that was on the top of Mount Pinus. And then it kind of shifted over to this place called the Sign, which is kind of in the same neighborhood. And so this is where condor watchers would gather to look for the last few remaining condors back in the 70s and 80s. All of this is just north of Los Angeles, and I'll show you a map in just a minute. By 1982, um, a decision had to be made because there were so few condors left. Remember, there was only 22 left at the time in the wild, but they made a what was at the time a very controversial decision to capture all the remaining wild condors and focus all their efforts on captive breeding, hoping it would work. And this is what's called a cannon net. I don't have a picture of a condor here, but they'll put a, a carcass here of say a calf as bait for the condors and the condor flies in and then they deploy the cannon net and it goes over the condor and then they can safely um, catch the condor in that way. So here's that area just north of LA, the Sespe Wilderness and Mount Pinus and there's Fraser Park on Interstate 5, Grapevine is just up here. So this is the area where the, the condor watch was back in the day and still is. And this is the area where they captured their last few remaining condors and also released um, a whole bunch of condors over the years. It's just, it's just north of Six Flags Magic Mountain. Some of you may know that. All this is going on just near millions and millions of people. The last wild condor captured uh, occurred in 1987, and that was AC9. And um, in 2002, they returned him to the wild. So that was a pretty momentous occasion after being in captivity for what, um, 15 years. Before they captured all the last remaining condors, they, they made one last attempt to to increase their numbers by stealing eggs from their nests. Um, as I mentioned before, condors will lay a second egg um, if the first one disappears. And so they would rappel down the cliff when the condor wasn't attending the nest and grab the egg and take it to a secure location like the San Diego uh, Wild Animal Park and raise it. And then the condor would come back and lay a second egg and then they would raise that egg. And that was helping to double the number of condors um, in the clutch for a time. Now this helped a little bit and they were able to raise a number of birds this way, extra birds, you might say, but in general, it just wasn't enough to save the condor. And so that's when they went to the decision to just capture all of the remaining condors and raise them in captivity. So as I, just um, described the, the, the first egg could be raised in captivity here. And here's one of those condors hatching in, in a captive environment. And the second egg could be raised in the wild by the parents. They did that for a while. Takes about two months for them to hatch. And here's one of the facilities, in fact, the main facility where this captive breeding and these eggs were being 
carefully taken care of, the condominium down in San Diego's Wild Animal Park. And the LA Zoo is the other main place for the early uh, captive breeding programs. Not all birds or animals for that matter will breed in captivity. The stress of being captive is just too much for some species. And so the researchers weren't initially sure if condors would breed in captivity. And that's one of the reasons capturing all the remaining condors was so controversial because they just didn't know if it was gonna work. Um, but fortunately, it turns out that condors will breed in captivity. And so um, after all the wild condors were captured and put into those two zoos, and later also into uh, um, the um, Idaho facility, which I'll describe in a minute, um, they started to raise these condors um, as chicks. And it's very important to avoid imprinting. So I've got another uh, show and tell item here. I've got one of these condor puppets. You can see that on my screen. This is one of the actual puppets that they use to feed the baby condors. It looks just like a, uh, an adult condor. And so they'll hide behind a little puppet screen and do a puppet show for the condors so that they think and they're fooled into thinking they're being raised by a condor when in fact it's a person wielding a puppet. But this works and this helps those condors avoid imprinting. And that's the key, especially at this young age, in those, the first few weeks, the first few months of their life, it's, it's super important for them not to be seeing human faces because we want these birds to be successfully re-released uh, into the wild and not come to people and think that they're a person. So after capturing all the condors and raising as many as they could in captivity, um, it was finally time to start releasing some of these condors back into the wild, and this started in 1992. And again, by this time, the Peregrine Funds, a World Center for the Birds of Prey, was also involved, along with San Diego and LA Zoos. Always a very exciting moment when a condor is about to be released. And every now and then, the public is invited to take part in one of these releases. Now, because uh, condors fare better in groups, they also released some Andean condors initially with those first California condors to keep them company, you might say. The Andean condors are also um, declining, but their situation is not nearly as severe as the California condors. So there are some to spare, you might say, that they can use to help with the California condor program. Now today you won't see any Andean condors out there with the California condors, but in those early years, you might have seen them. All of the condors are marked with special tags on their wings and numbers so that they can be identified by bird watchers and by scientists without having to recapture them. You can just see what numbers on there and report it. If you see a condor today, it's also likely to have a, a tag on there. So note the number that's on it and report it to eBird. So they started releasing these condors uh, in that area I showed you before, just north of Magic Mountain along Interstate 5. And uh, they had even purchased an extra um, chunk of land, 14,000 acres, just for to give condors you know, some breathing room, some room to roam. Today, there's uh, four zoos involved in the captive breeding of California condors. You can add the Oregon Zoo's Johnson Center for Wildlife Conservation to the list, um, to the other three I've already mentioned. So currently, um, condor, California condors are in, um, remember how they used to range all the way up along the coast and into Mexico? Well, now they're, they've, been re-released into three or four, depending how you look at it, different places. Um, these green blobs just show areas where condor, California condors have been spotted. But let me go through the, the different places where they have released condors. Of course, the main group, the main population still continues to be this one population just north of LA. 
um, which, which is called the Sespe wilderness. Um, some of these birds, as you'll see in a moment, are ranging up into the foothills of the Sierras and even over to Sequoia National Park now through Kern County. And there's another group, another population that's here up, up near Big Sur and a place called Pinnacles uh, National Park, I think it is now. Um, and so those condors can be seen up here near Big Sur and Pinnacles. And some of those birds sometimes mix and that's why it shows the green connecting. So you have one population here that's spreading and one population here uh, near Big Sur. And then you have another fairly big population in this Grand Canyon now that can be seen at the south rim of the Grand Canyon and over at a place called Vermilion Cliffs near the north rim of the Grand Canyon. And a few of these birds from the Grand Canyon's Arizona group have found their way to Utah and can be seen in the southern section of Zion National Park. So that's what this green blob is representing here. So these condors who can cover hundreds of miles in a day very easily, you know, are starting to branch out and explore and expand their ranges a bit. And then you've got a population down here in Mexico, I'm going to mention. And uh, so it's just south of the border, they've released some condors and they're living down there. And, and at least one of those birds uh, flew around San Diego and then went back into Mexico. And so remember, Anza Borrego is just about here. So it's just a matter of time before one of these birds from the Mexican population does a few laps around Borrego Springs. Anyway, the Grand Canyon is one of the easiest and most beautiful places to see a condor flying free. So if you want to see a, a wild California condor, go to the south rim of the Grand Canyon and just park yourself on the edge um, of the canyon right behind the Bright Angel Lodge and just wait. They're there almost every day. Never missed them. And as I mentioned, uh, some of those Grand Canyon birds uh, are also being found in Utah now. And another, probably the, the maybe the second easiest place to see them besides the Grand Canyon area is uh, near Big Sur. So it, when they reopen uh, Highway 1, I think sections of it are still closed. Uh, but when that is reopened again near Big Sur, you can drive along Highway 1 along the coast and have a real good chance to see condors flying overhead or maybe down on the beach feeding on a dead whale like these are. And Pinnacles National Park, also another place to, to watch for condors in that same general area. And as I mentioned, in, uh, their condors are now flying free in Mexico for the first time in 70 years almost. Uh, in 2007, um, California condors were released in Mexico, just south of the border. So we have a population down there. And just recently, last year, uh, for the very first time in 50 years, condors were spotted in Sequoia National Park. So that was exciting as they expand their range into the Sierras. They're getting close to Yosemite too, I've heard. So they had initial goals uh, with this um, reintroduction program and they've achieved most of those goals and um, numbers are up. And uh, the latest numbers I could find in 2021 is that there are over 518 California condors now, including uh, over 300, well over 300 in the wild. And these are scattered in, again, three or four populations, I guess you would call it four, um, at least four, Southern California, kind of mid Northern California, Arizona and Mexico. So four populations. The main population again is that one just North of Los Angeles. Some bad news recently, uh, we, had, <clears throat> we had some big fires last year, you're aware of I'm sure. And um, we lost six, at least 16 condors in that fire near Big Sur. Uh, but the good news to go with this is that they released seven condors uh, that were raised in San Diego in that same area um, this last fall. And again, this is something we're hoping to see. It's not a good year for wildflowers in Borrego, but one of these days, 
and it could be soon, we're gonna see a California condor just flying right over Borrego Springs. It'll be very exciting. Could be tomorrow. So the condor is what we call an umbrella species. We've set aside a lot of land, um, just for condors, uh, and they need a lot of room to roam. But um, it's called an umbrella species because there's a lot of other species that are going to benefit now from that land that we have set aside for condors. And so they, they kind of get protection under the same umbrella that the condor is providing. So when we set aside habitat, it's not just for one species. Many species benefit from our efforts. I was really into condors as a kid and had to have everything condor, including this model. <laughs> and uh, stamps is another thing I collected and I was always looking for condor stamps. There's a lot of books. Um, these are just a few. I've got more than this, but um, a lot of books written about condors if you want to read up and read more about them. Condors even featured on the California quarter, if you take a close look at it. It should be our state bird, right? But um, it's not. And here's some more of those books on California condors. If you ever want to see them, I've got them all. Just come over to the College of the Desert. Um, so, you know, we can all do things to help condors, like supporting the organizations that help support condors. And here are some of those organizations. And hopefully the ban on lead ammunition will spread to other states and eventually to the entire country. And that will benefit not just condors, but a lot of other birds, too, that are victims of lead poisoning, like waterfowl. What a beautiful bird, huh? And that's the end. Okay. Um, so thank you very much, Kurt. That was a great presentation. I really enjoyed that. Um, if you want to ask questions, uh, now is the time when you can. You can click the little Q&A button on your screen there and ask a question. And Kurt, if you can see that, uh, that you can work your own way through the questions if you wish uh, to do that. You, you yeah. probably can see those questions, right? I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I can and I will. I'm going to stop sharing and that'll help yeah. me see things better. But before I stop sharing, um, again, I just want to point out my email address there. So if you, if you do want to contact me after the talk, copy that down right now before I take it off the screen. Because it's kind of hard to spell my name, I know. Um, but, but please um, contact me with follow up questions. Or, um, you know, if you want to get on our Desert Cities Bird Club email list or find out more about the Hawk Watch and Anza Brego, whatever's on your mind, just send me an email or send me pictures of birds you can't identify, raptors and others, and I'll help you figure out what they are. Sounds great. So I'm going to take that off the screen now. So it's Kay Leuschner at collegeofthedesert.edu. Um, did I stop sharing? Yes, you did. Oh, good. Okay, so we've got questions. I don't know that I can see those. Are they? Oh, I, can they I can do it. That's fine. Uh, I can. I can work through that. Um, so Lorraine asked. So why is there a hole in the vulture's beak? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, maybe it has something to do with their nasal <laughs> passages and smelling, mm -hmm. and also to drain. Yeah, you remember they're plunging their, their beaks and their head into rotting carcasses, which are very slimy. And it helps them, I think it helps them clean up and drain all that stuff away too, and clean it up. Okay. Why, why uh, did uh, people vomit, I see. Yeah. Well, I, I, it's probably a defensive mechanism to, you know, to... It's, it's very foul smelling. It's, it, nobody wants to be vomited on. And so it's a defense mechanism. If they feel threatened, that's their response because they don't really have uh, other ways to defend themselves like, like a, maybe a raptor might. 
Um, have turkey vulture enzymes been studied as an antidote? Um, good question, Betsy. Um, I'm confident that they are studying those enzymes, but I don't have any data on my fingertips to mention. But I would hope, and I'm, and I'm pretty confident that yes, people are studying those enzymes because there's a lot we can learn from those enzymes. Um, somebody says there's been black vultures in CT for the past several years. What's CT? <laughs> Connecticut. Um, Connecticut? Oh, Connecticut. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, Connecticut. Okay, so yeah, they're, I guess they're spreading northward from Florida. Yeah, interesting. Is Buzzard Day, uh, oh, Brago Buzzard Day a future event? Well, um, talk to Hal next week. Let Betsy ask you that question, so she should know the answer to that. But um, we could have a Buzzard Day, yes. I'm all for it. To go with our Swainson's Hawk events and our bird festival can be one big festival. And yes, let's do a scoreboard on the Christmas circle. Welcome to Brago Springs. I can't wait to see that. Um, let's see, can you speak to the vulture social structure and when migrating, how large a group do they kettle when migrating? They definitely kettle when migrating and you can go out tomorrow morning and see that at the Hawk Watch at about 8.30 to nine. Um, and they'll be in groups of, of many hundreds of vultures sometimes. Uh, we had a couple hundred the other day. And so when they migrate, they're, they're definitely very social. Uh, they stick together, they roost together, they have those communal roosting sites. Um, and then even when they nest, they often nest uh, close to one another on some cliff somewhere. So turkey vultures are very social throughout the year. Um, the Oregon Zoo, is, a is there a chance that condors will be, will be released in the Pacific Northwest? The answer is yes, yes. And I think that's one of the reasons the Oregon Zoo is involved because I, th I think that's definitely one of the next plans is to have a population in the Pacific Northwest. So watch for that. Um, that would be great to add to those other four populations. And then eventually when all the five populations start mixing, you know, we'll just have one big range of condors like we had in the Lewis and Clark days. So yes to that. Um, where are tropical looking king condors located? Um, yeah, those are down in places like Costa Rica and, and, and south of there. Um, so get into the tropics. They're not, um, the king vultures, they're not um, common though. It's always a special treat to see one of those. Uh, what happened with the released Andean condors? Good question. Um, they recaptured them once they weren't needed anymore. And then they um, either kept them in the zoo if they were zoo birds or maybe shipped them back to Peru or wherever they came from to be released there. That's a, that's a good question too, but they're no longer needed in those um, release programs because they've got plenty of condors to kind of keep the social structure together. Um, can I get more details about what was so controversial about bringing the condors in and what groups were against it? Boy, that's a long answer. Um, <laughs> there's a couple of books you can read about that or go online and, and see some very opinionated um, opinions on both sides. Um, it was, you know, there, there's something about taking the last of something out of the wild that, that some people are just dead against. And I can understand that because it's, it's a pretty um, tough, to, you know, difficult decision to make to take the last of something out of the wild because you never know if it's going to go back again. And then if you do re-release something into the wild, you wonder, will it ever be the same? Will it ever have that same wildness to it? And so again, there were just some people who just did not want to see that happen under any circumstances. And the other part of the controversy was they just weren't sure that the captive breeding was going to work because it doesn't work in a lot of uh, specialized birds like condors. And so there was a big risk. And, and fortunately it did work, you know, and they did breed in captivity and they were able to bring the numbers up and, but, but they sure weren't, um, they weren't sure about that in the beginning. And you can't blame uh, people for being skeptical 
that it might work. Um, where is the nearest area to see California condors? Well, they, recently uh, some have been seen just north of LA, um, just south of Gorman on the Interstate 5. So drive the Interstate 5 uh, north of LA and before you get to the grapevine, kind of look to your left and pull off and you might get lucky and see a condor right there, which is very near um, Fraser Park and Mount Pinus and where they used to have that condor watch and tequila bust that I told you about. So that would be the nearest place to see them, but, but you wanna go online and, and see, go to ebird.org maybe and see where people have been reporting condors. Um, otherwise, like I said, go to the South Rim of the Grand Canyon or make your way up to Big Sur or Pinnacles National Park. Um, can you talk about the head anatomy of the male condor, the caruncle? Yeah, I don't, I don't know much about, I don't know much detail about that. So I guess I would say, um, look that one up to find out what it is you're looking for in terms of details. But you, you can see that the head of, of the condor is very ornate and unusual looking and devoid of feathers and so, but, but there's other details there that, um, I can't really comment on right now. Um, somebody says um, they live in Oregon and they see turkey vultures kettle and they set off south. I'd love to know what their path is and where they'll end up for the winter. Yeah, um, I assume you're talking about turkey vultures. Um, yeah, I'd like to know where they winter too. So what we do is uh, have some researchers put some of those um, satellite tags uh, those little harnesses that they can put on the backs of turkey vultures and then track those birds and we can see exactly where your birds are wintering. You know, they could be wintering just in Southern California or in Mexico, or they could be flying all the way down to Central America without um, putting one of those tracking devices on them. We just can't know for sure, but somebody will eventually and you'll get your answer. Are there any videos or documentaries recommended? Um, there are some, if you go online and just Google um, condor or turkey vulture um, movies, you might run into some of those. Uh, there's one that I show the class. It's an old, oldie but a goodie. It's a documentary though. It's called um, Shadows of the Condor, I believe it is. So it's probably online somewhere, but I'm sure there's lots of other stuff too. Um, do the male and female condors and turkey vultures both sit on the nest and care for the young? Do they mate for life? Yes, they, they tend to mate for life. Um, and so they, they do their best to try to find that same mate each breeding season at their favorite nesting site. Um, and I know the condors, and I'm guessing the turkey vultures do too, but I know the condors share the nesting duties. The male will sit on it for a while while the female's out hunting finding food and then they switch. Because when they were stealing those eggs that I showed you from the nest so that they would double clutch, um, they actually timed it to go down to the nest when the condors were about to make an exchange. So when the one condor is about to come in for its shift and the other condor is about to leave to go out for its hunting shift or its food gathering shift, they actually um, abandon the nest for a few minutes. And it's in those few minutes where they would steal the eggs. I think that's it for the questions. So, uh, you know, thank you all for your attention. I'll stick around for a little while if there are any more people want to chat. But thank you all for attending and supporting ABNA. And I hope that you'll join um, ABNA, abdnha.org. Thanks, Mike. There you go. You already, that's what I was going to tell people is to, uh, uh, make sure they visit us at abdnha.org. And um, this program tonight has been recorded um, and uh, it will be available. If you go to our website and you go to the same place where you, where you signed up for this program, uh, we'll put a little link there and the program will be online for um, about two weeks. And I would say it'll be there within 24 hours. I hope it'll be there a lot sooner than that. But if you look back in, you know, in, in 24 hours and it'll, it'll be there um, by that time. And so with that, I wanna wrap the program up. I wanna uh, invite everyone to Brago Springs, uh, join Avna, um, see what we have here. It's a wonderful place. It's a wonderful little town as well. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you all.